So welcome everyone tonight to, um, we've got a great uh, session tonight on COVID-19 in Australia. <clears throat> um, we've specifically asked um, Greg Daw to bring us up to date on the Delta variant and long COVID. And um, we're lucky enough to also have Patrick Cashman here, who's going to um, talk to us about vaccine hesitancy. Um, I'd initially like to acknowledge our uh, acknowledgement of country. Um, I would like to start tonight's meeting by acknowledging the people of the Wiradjuri Nation and the different nations on which each of our participants meet tonight. I would like to acknowledge that we work on the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and nations and pay respect to Elders past, present, future and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water, culture and community. We are committed to working in the spirit of partnership and collaboration with our region's Aboriginal communities and peoples to improve their health, emotional and social well-being. I am warmly welcome Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Australians who are present tonight. Before we get started, just a couple of key housekeeping points. Um, please type your questions into the question box and presenters will answer them at the end of their presentation. And please note that this webinar is being recorded. Firstly, we'll just like to um, do a brief introduction of our guest speakers tonight. Um, Professor Greg Dorr is the head of viral hepatitis at the Clinical Research Program at the Kirby Institute at the Uni of New South Wales, Sydney, and infectious disease physician at St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with Greg over the years. He's been the president of the Australian Society for HIV, viral hepatitis and sexual health medicine and a member of the National Health and Medical Research Council and is a NHMRC practitioner fellow. He is a member of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences and has been very involved in the COVID-19 response, um, including um, the post-COVID ADAPT study that we'll hear about tonight. Our next uh, speaker is Patrick Cashman, who is the immunisation coordinator for the Hunter New England. Um, Patrick has worked in Victoria, Tasmania, Northern Territory and New South Wales in emergency infectious disease and remote health. Patrick is currently the immunisation coordinator at the Hunter New England LHD. Um, his operational and research interests include communicable diseases, health work or education, Aboriginal health and adverse events following immunisation surveillance. He's the project manager for Vax Tracker, which some of you may and um, PhD candidate University in Vax, at Newcastle in vaccine study. And then I'm mainly the facilitator, but I'll do a little bit of a talk at the end. And um, I think most of you probably know me, but I've been a rural general practitioner for 30 years. And over the years, I've focused on several health areas, including women's health, sexual health, and viral hepatitis. Um, providing hep C assessment and treatment to those west of the Blue Mountains became a passion for me in 2019. and um, since the introduction of the direct acting antivirals, I've successfully treated over 160 patients living with hep C in the orange region. As I said, I've been privileged to collaborate in two hep C studies with Professor Greg Dorr over the last 10 years. And I continue to enjoy and work upskilling people across this area. I now work in ambulatory care and we're just preparing ourselves as the rest of the area for um, the next phase of COVID treatment. So, um, We'd like to just move on now, if we could, to Patrick. I'd like to hand over to you, and then at the end of that session, we'll have um, about five. Oh, we'll have some time for questions, um, for at least um, ten or fifteen minutes of questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Anne. Hello, everyone. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak tonight. Um, it's a busy time in public health and um, getting these vaccines out to people uh, is obviously the right thing to do, but some people are a bit reluctant to have them. So I'll just talk about that briefly tonight. Um, acknowledge we're meeting on, on Aboriginal land in, in this country. Uh, and I'm on Warramai land as I speak to you today. Uh, vaccine hesitancy is interesting. So if, just two years ago, before the pandemic, the World Health Organization outlined vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 major threats to the world's health. Uh, so that's before the pandemic. So people reluctant to have the vaccines was already slated as an important um, part. And this, this one of the things that that will contribute to is weak primary health care. Now that's something you wouldn't know about in the 
in, in the Western Districts, the PHN and the wonderful primary health care you provide there. Um, but we've got to really um, look at vaccine hesitancy. So one of the groups I'm involved in is COSI, the Co Collaboration for Social Science and Immunisation, and that's associated with the National Centre at Westmead Kids Hospital. And two of the people involved in that is Professor Julie Lees from Sydney University, and just two years ago, the Australian Financial Review named their most powerful woman of the year. And Julie's work on vaccine hesitancy got her named uh, that from the Australian Financial Review. And again, that was just before the pandemic. So uh, this, this whole idea of vaccine hesitancy has been very powerful. Uh, and also, um, Associate Professor Margie Denchen, who's a paediatrician in Melbourne uh, and leads a lot of this work. And, and Margie and Julie are absolutely fantastic. So if you're looking for people to to look for their research and their work that they're doing in vaccine hesitancy in Australia, these are two of the leading lights. Um, so just 12 months ago, the government had purchased four different vaccines and it looked like we had a lot of vaccine on the way and this was going to be a doddle. Um, but if we look across them from left to right, the Oxford vaccine, well, that seems to have a um, an adverse event that worries people. The Queensland vaccine fell over um, and HIV was involved in that. And I'm sure uh, Greg would know a lot of detail about that. Um, the Novavax is not here yet. And the Pfizer's here, but not in the sort of supply that we need. So this looks like we got truckloads of vaccine, but in fact, we don't. Uh, so that's really difficult when you've got a lot of people wanting vaccine, uh, but it's not yet available. So one of the things people say is these vaccines have been rushed. So this is a wonderful graphic from Jane Halton, and she's um, a very credible person in this vaccine space. So normally, <laughs> vaccines are a terrible investment. If you wanna invest, if you're a pharmaceutical company, and you want to invest in something, then you want that something that's, uh, that people are going to take every day, They're going to get prescribed every day, people are going to use it for the rest of their lives. A good vaccine, it's really expensive to make, a lot of risk bringing it to the market. Some of them don't get to the market, so you spend all this money, don't get it to the market. And then if it's good, you just give it once and never, no one ever buys it again. So it's a terrible investment. So vaccines usually have terrible investment. But what's happened obviously with COVID, there's truckloads of money has been put into it. Now, normally this top graphic here shows you that normally what happens is you've got to go all through all these steps to build a vaccine and then to get it to the market. And you're not going to invest in something down the track unless you've got all the pre-steps in place. So you're not going to build a factory to build vaccines until you absolutely get it approved. And that's why it can take about a decade at least to get a vaccine to market. But what's happened with these COVID vaccines, there's lots of investment, lots of things happening. And so that's all happened in parallel. So the factory's getting, being get built before the vaccine's been approved. So what's sped up is the administration and the business case, not the science. The science is rock solid and it's been done in proper time. Now I can find references to uh, messenger RNA vaccines back as far as 2005, just quickly myself. So these these have all been building blocks. They haven't started from scratch. If you're a carpenter and you build tables, you've got your shed, you've got your tools, you've got your know-how. You've never built a chair, but you know how to build a table. And that's what these vaccines are like. So although you're a carpenter, you've, you've been, someone says, oh, can you build me a chair? And you go, oh, I've never done that before, but you've got your tools, you've got your know-how, you know how to do it. And that's what the vaccines are like. So they're, they're not starting from absolute scratch. Uh, so this is the sort of situation, this is, um, I've, I've gone for high class references tonight. This is from Channel 9. Um, this is, um, and, and the phrase you hear from the uh, United States is it's become a disease of the unvaccinated. And that's why we're talking about vaccine hesitancy tonight. So, so this is pretty stark figures from two weeks ago. Of the 175 people in Australian ICU wards this year, 168 were not vaccinated. Eight patients had one dose and none were fully vaccinated. So the vaccine's not gonna stop you getting the disease. It's not gonna stop every infection but it's really gonna do a really good job of keeping you out of hospital and keeping you out of ICU and getting those bad end results with, that we saw in Italy, United Kingdom, I India and Indonesia. So it's a really good at keep, keeping, at stopping that high end bad result and protecting the healthcare system. We can't afford to have so many people in ICU. Uh, and, and the CDC says the same. So the vaccine decreases hospitalization by 29 times. That's why in the United States they're calling it the pandemic of the unvaccinated. So we really wanna 
people to have vaccines. Now you don't have to be a vaccine expert when you're talking to someone, but it's good just to have a general idea how the, how the things work. Now the coronavirus here on the left, those red spike proteins that are so famous, you've read a lot about, all the vaccines doing, the graphic on the right is a lovely graphic from nature, just showing you the normal infection of a coronavirus into, the, into our cells and then it proliferates and then our um, immune system meets it and then builds up immunity. So it just recognises that spike protein and builds up immunity. The problem of course is if it's the first time you've met it, you might not survive that, that looking at the spike protein. So all the vaccine's doing is simulating that spike protein in an undangerous way and, you, and the body builds up the immunity in exactly the same way. So it's good just to have a, a vague idea of how these things work so you can answer some simple questions about people's hesitancy. And they're not bizarre. So in medicine, we simulate healthy healing practices of the body. Now, when someone fractures a bone, we don't get in there and knit it together cell to cell. We make the bone straight and then the body heals itself. It takes a few weeks, a few months, um, but the body does the healing. And it's the same with a vaccine. You give someone a vaccine and it stimulates the immune system, our normal immune system, this is what it does. It makes antibodies, it recognises spike, spike proteins, that's what the immune system will do. All you're doing with the vaccine is simulating that. But you know, you, with a, you sit down in the evening and just search the internet for how the vaccines work. There's lots of really good explanations. There's some great webinars and stuff around small investment, but it really helps you to be able to understand a little bit to answer some people's questions. Um, but why are people hesitant? So one of the reasons is, is what we call heuristics. It's, it's the reason people make decisions. So some people, uh, so people use heuristics to process risk information. It's very complex out there. So these are like mental shortcuts that allow people to make rapid judgments when they're dealing with large volumes of information. They don't have to be an absolute expert to come to an opinion. They use these mental shortcuts and they bring their values to, with them when they're right, weighing the risks up. Now they're going to give the risks more weight if they're highly publicised. So everyone's heard of these blood clots with AstraZeneca, so they're going to in their minds, they increase that risk because they've heard so much about it. Now, some people anticipate negative emotions because of a decision and they anticipate regret. Oh, what if I, I talk someone into having the vaccine and they got that blood clot? So they don't do that. And some people prefer an outcome of doing nothing. I'd rather sit here and not get a vaccine and just see what happens rather than actively doing something. And some people will avoid taking risk when the outcome is uncertain. And this, this is how people think and how people uh, think, feel and act on risks. So they don't have to be an expert, don't have to read or an encyclopedia about a vaccine. They can just hear something on the news and go, nah, that's not for me. So it's good to um, have that understanding of how people think and come to a decision not to vaccinate themselves or their families. Uh, so there's this thing called the, the five C. So, and this, this is sort of logical. So the, uh, you need confidence. Uh, you need trust in the government to have the vaccine. Uh, now this is really, really important because people are going to come to your clinic and they have trust in your, um, your processes that you've drawn up the vaccine correctly. You know where to inject it. You're going to give people the right information. So you've got to be really professional and really good at your job. So the people have the confidence to come in. Yeah, if you're running a shoddy show, no one's gonna come in and have a vaccine. So high professional standards, even if you're doing an outreach, even if you're out in a tent, even if you're doing an, um, something in a vehicle, you've gotta do it really professionally good. So your professional standards and getting it right make all the difference. Um, and obviously complacency, if you don't see the risks, uh, then you're not going to uh, go and have the vaccine. And Australia's definitely been in this situation. And sadly, Western New South Wales, it's changing as we see um, disease in um, uh, Wilcannia and Walgett, and unfortunately, a gentleman die in Dubbo. Um, constraints, so that's the, um, that's the uh, lack of vaccine that we've talked about. 
and people make risk calculations and that's the heuristics of how they make those risk calculations. And also with vaccines, there's this sort of sense of collective responsibility. So if I vaccinate, it's good for you. If you vaccinate, it's good for me. So it's more than just our individual selves. Now, one criticism of that model I just put up was that, that it's an individual model. So this is a paper from South Africa that said, well, that's fine, but you've got to add some stuff to it. And if you think of people who are excluded in our society, so maybe Aboriginal people, uh, there's a lot of people who feel um, that the uh, world is not, not going their way and they feel quite excluded. So, um, so vaccine hesitancy for some people is mediated by their experiences of social exclusion. So if the government's trying to talk you into a vaccine and you're worried about everything the government does and the government doesn't look after you, you might not trust them. And obviously we've got the vaccines, people see us as part of that process. Uh, so the, the trust of government is sabotaged and the, um, the climate of social connectedness is decreased and these experiences may lead many marginalised people to distrust vaccination. Um, and then they may resist vaccination as a form of agency. It gives them some strength. So if they've seen something on the news, they form an opinion, heuristics might not be based on very much evidence, but then they can uh, at least have control over that part of their lives. So this is a, uh, a paper from South Africa that puts this view. So those five C's are individualistic, plus this sort of uh, sense of where people are in the world. Now, Julie Lees gives you some practical tips on when you're talking with people about vaccines. Uh, so one is deal with people's emotions. So it's not just facts, but some people might feel really nervous about having the vaccine. So recognise people are nervous, recognise people are worried, deal with people's emotions. Um, there's this sort of sense of rather than is there anything else you want to address, which is a huge question, is there something else I can address? They might just be worried about one thing and would you be willing to come back and talk to me again or would you be willing to? So these are just little tips in terms of the way we talk with people because you're um, having consultations with people all the time, you'll you'll be very uh, in, in, in touch with, with that. Now a lot of Aboriginal people uh, there's a lot of misinformation uh, with, you know, the microchips and you see um, uh, Facebook posts with people putting magnets on people's arms and saying, oh, there must be something in that vaccine. Uh, there's all these worries that we might not think are valid, but it is to the person. So we've got to take them seriously. I don't think anyone's ever had a vaccine when they're worried by being badgered into it. So telling someone they're dumb and their ideas are stupid is probably not helpful. So take them seriously, they're your patient. And although we're running big clinics and trying to see hundreds of people and get them vaccinated, give people the time of day. Really, really important that you respect who they are, that their ideas are, are reasonable to them and we've got to start from there. So don't just dismiss someone. Um, now there's lots and lots of stuff being done on vaccine safety. So I started up Vax Tracker that feeds data into Ausvac Safety. This is all on a public website. Uh, we've had nearly 4 million people um, answer surveys after they've been vaccinated. So we've got lots of information on vaccine safety. Um, now uh, less than half the people report that they had any adverse event, but some of these vaccines do knock you around for a day or two. So tell people that so they know what to expect. Um, with Pfizer, it seems to be the second dose more than the first dose. With AstraZeneca, it's more the first dose. But that's 4, 000, 4 million surveys have been collected. So, so there's nothing hidden about these vaccines. Now the TGA put out every week data on what's happening with vaccine safety. So this is TTS cases to the week of the 26th of August. So this is really current. They put this out every week. Two new cases, one a 34 year old woman from New South Wales. Uh, probable T T TTS cases, um, six. Um, and then they also put out data, accumulative data. So again, this is just up to last week. Um, we've had 116 cases of TTS in Australia, 50 men and 66 women, and there's been six deaths. Um, so those, all women bar one, woman 34, 48, 2248, 152 year old, a 72 year old, and one in a 44 year old man. So this data is on the TGA website. There's nothing hidden. People are worried that 
vaccine advocates like all us around here are hiding the body somewhere and not telling people. People are having a terrible time and we're not telling people. The opposite is true. It's completely transparent. There is no conspiracy. There's nothing to nothing unseen here. It's all publicly available data. If something goes wrong, we want to find out about it and do something about it. So the blood clots, we didn't know anything about it. We started giving the vaccine. We did a lot of surveillance. We found the blood clots and Atagi said, oh, maybe we shouldn't be giving that to people under 50. They looked at the data again, so oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing that to giving that to people under 60. And so the, the rules change because the evidence changes and people are looking at the evidence. So there's nothing hidden. It's all um, transparent. Now, this is probably your go-to piece of evidence from ATAGI. Um, it's a wonderful little document on balancing up the risks and the evidence. So on the left-hand side, uh, and many of you, you will be familiar with this, and this is probably useful to have printed out on your desk when you're talking to people about the vaccine. So on the left-hand side is the potential risk of blood clots. And you can see there that they peak um, in the um, 40 to 49, that's five in 100,000. So if you had the MCG full of people, that would be five people with TTS. If you vaccinated 100,000 people of this age with um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, you can see the risk falls again over 60, but over 60, the risk of the disease on the right-hand side in blue goes up enormously, which is why Atagi's drawn that line there. Now, our problem is, um, uh, health professionals at the moment is we've got AstraZeneca in our fridge, the Pfizer's not very available, um, the disease is now in New South Wales, so should people under 60 have the AstraZeneca vaccine? And this is the risk benefit, we do this with medicine all the time, you recommend someone goes for an operation, they talk to a surgeon and the surgeon says, this is the risk of the, vac of the operation, this is the risk if you, if you don't have the operation. And the, in this case, it's a similar sort of risk, risk benefit. And this is a really nice graphic to show it. So for younger people in their 30s and 20s, the risk of blood clots is very, very low, although the risk of the disease is low. Uh, for people in their 40s and 50s, um, it's a difficult decision, um, um, but one you can talk, talk um, through with them and show them this graphic. So if they're really worried about the disease, if the disease is coming to their town, uh, if you're in Wilcannia, then you, this risk of the blood clots might look very low to you. Um, now, but when you're talking to people, the risk of the blood, the blood clot is caused by an immune response to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So the AstraZeneca vaccine gets the antibodies that it causes, gets the platelets to clump together. So it's an immune blood clot. It's got nothing to do with the normal risks of blood clots. So if you've got patients who smoke a bit, a bit sedentary, a little bit overweight, and they're sitting duck for a normal blood clot risk, and you've got them on some anticoagulants, their risk of a blood clot to AstraZeneca is not increased. Now, a lot of people are gonna be worried. They might be over 60, you're offering them an AstraZeneca, and they're going, oh, I'm doing everything I can to avoid having a stroke, and you're gonna give me this vaccine, which is associated with blood clots. That association is not to do with normal blood clot risk. They're completely different. So that's a really important point. Um, the other important point is we can recognize the risks of the blood clot. So a few months ago when those six people died, it was a bit new and we were missing them. Now we're much better at recognizing them. There's some really good ATAGI information. The one on the left is for health practitioners, the one on the right for patients. And we need to tell people if we are giving people under 60 or anyone a, an AstraZeneca vaccine, these are the things they need to look out for. So obviously with the um, uh, a headache, um, four days after vaccination that's unrelieved with normal analgesia, maybe worse when they're lying down, obviously associated with nausea and vomiting, um, blurred vision, difficulty to sp uh, speech, um, any chest pain because of PE, uh, swelling in your leg, DVT, and you can also get the clots in, in the belly with the um, uh, uh, a, um, a splenic um, blood clot. Uh, so, and also it distal to the uh, injection site, uh, some petechiae. So we need to tell people this so that they can look out and present early if, if in fact they are one of those very rare people uh, that 
uh, does get TTS. Uh, FANS, the Australian and New Zealand um, Hematological uh, Association, have got wonderful, wonderful guidelines. And if you're giving people AstraZeneca, you should be very familiar with this so that you can pick up early signs, take the right blood tests. You need to be doing platelets, you need to be doing D-dimers, you need to be doing them serially, and you need to be referring people in. So that's really, really important to have that uh, flow chart um, available so that you, if you're giving AstraZeneca, you're providing the safest environment uh, for people uh, to be able to have that vaccine. Uh, and, and then, uh, this is my last slide, uh, and then just stories I think help. Now normally with vaccines, we've, we've all looked after kids with whooping cough and seen them trouble breathing. And when we talk to young parents, we can bring those stories uh, to the table and, and, and give them our experience as health practitioners. Uh, as yet, thankfully, we can't do that with COVID yet in Western New South Wales, apart from <laughs> Uh, some doctors and nurses in Dubbo today um, because we haven't had the experience but there's lots of stories from overseas uh, so this is just uh, something from the newspaper so this is this guy's 42 uh, he's from the UK he's a mountain climber Jim Nutt really really healthy he didn't take the vaccine because he was worried about putting a poison into his healthy body and the um, story on the right is the intensivist um, who said that she's looking after a lot of people uh, tubing them and they're really regretting the worst decision of their life was not to get vaccinated. Uh, so we need to work with people, understand where they're coming from, be gentle with them, don't tell them they're wrong and, and work through them and work through their, their fears, um, give them the time of day and, and hopefully get that vaccine into them. But the biggest problem at the moment is supply. Uh, so hopefully we can get some more vaccine and, and then you can get that out to your communities and protect them before the virus comes up the highway. Thanks, Anne. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. We've um, got a few minutes um, for a few questions. Um, I know there had been one prior that someone was just worried um, about the risk of fertility with AstraZeneca, Patrick, and that there wasn't any clear um, guidelines there. But yeah, you got a sort of... Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, ATAGI uh, and the TGA say that they don't approve any vaccines uh, that affect fertility. Uh, so having um, a vaccine, um, if you're trying to fall pregnant is fine. Uh, now there is a fear that the, um, there is a fear that the spike protein looks a little bit like uh, synthesin one protein uh, which helps in placental development, but that, uh, according to ATAGI, is not the case. Uh, so there is a fear there with a specific um, misunderstanding with the um, AstraZeneca vaccine um, and the similarity between a spike protein and a protein in the placenta, uh, but according to the ATAGI, that that is actually not the case. Um, now with um, pregnancy, Pfizer's the preferred vaccine in pregnancy. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, um, there's just another question here um, that both of you might um, um, address, but what do you know about the South, new South African variant C12 that is meant to be more virulent and evades um, current vaccines? And also the elderly had their vaccine in April, aren't they due for a booster soon? I'll let, um, I think Greg's um, gonna talk yeah. to Variants. I'm, um, I'm happy to cover the variant. Um, and well, there's no evidence that there is increased infectiousness uh, with C12. I mean, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, clearly, we've got to look for new variants, but um, it's not something that's really concerning me at the moment. Um, you know, Delta still, I'll show some data. Uh, Delta is still very much the dominant variant globally. I, I really haven't seen anything else emerge. It looks like it's going to be more infectious. Thanks, Greg. The boosters are a good question. So um, Israel started boosters. They're seeing a drop off in immunity after uh, eight or nine months. Uh, we're still getting round one done. So our big job at the moment is to get two vaccines into everybody uh, and the booster question in Australia hasn't been addressed yet. I'll cover that, Annie, in the talk as well. I'm showing some data on uh, protection over time. Okay, that's great. There's just one more question and we might move on to Greg. Um, just one fella in Broken Hill says both his uncle and a cousin of his both developed a stroke shortly after vaccine. One was Pfizer, the other one AstraZeneca. 
is the clotting risk familial in some? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, no, we don't think so. We we the the risk is not um, are higher in, in some groups than others. There are some people that we advise not to get the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, and they're quite a, uh, a very small group of people. Um, but the uh, even without vaccine, some people get strokes, unfortunately. So whether the vaccine um, contributed to the stroke, if it's a TTS, uh, so the uh, thrombocytic um, syndrome, uh, then, then absolutely, the vaccine's been a cause. But uh, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of strokes can happen without any involvement of the vaccine. And any uh, in Australia at the moment, anyone that gets a stroke or a bad blood clot um, uh, in relationship to the vaccine is investigated, and that's why the TGA can publish those numbers. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, I think Ivy Chu's just put a relevant um, guidelines for GPs that um, we can share later. We I might just move on now to um, Greg to um, take us through um, the Delta variant and um, long COVID and then, then have some more time for questions. And if you've got questions for um, either Patrick or um, Greg, we can have more time at the end. And Annie, can you see my full screen now? Yes. Yep. Great. So Annie, thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, so I'll try and give you a bit of a, a quick tour through some key sort of clinical and public health issues uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, a tiny bit about the natural history and the impact that natural history has in terms of therapeutic intervention, particularly antiviral versus immunomodulatory intervention. Talk about a couple of the major therapeutic agents that we've used, remdesivir and dexamethasone, um, and then a new agent that's just been approved by the TGA, citrovimab. It's a monoclonal antibody. It looks pretty exciting uh, for community-based care. Um, then I'll move on to long COVID. As Annie mentioned, I've been involved in a post-COVID study looking at prevalence, risk factors, and natural history of long COVID, the ADAPT study through St Vincent's Hospital. Uh, then move on to discussing the Delta variant, which is the dominant global variant that's circulating at the moment, and uh, vaccine effectiveness. And then a little bit towards the end about how we might open up as we move forward, hopefully at very high vaccine coverage levels. So look, it has been unprecedented times. It's 21 months uh, into the pandemic, 260, 216 million cases globally, at least diagnosed, obviously many more undiagnosed and four and a half million deaths. In Australia, just over 50,000 cases, and unfortunately, we just ticked over uh, 1,000 deaths in the last sort of day or so. Um, our first case in Australia was the 25th of January uh, last year. It seems a very long time ago now. Um, so the first case at St Vincent's was on the 9th of March. Uh, we had a relatively small sort of first wave. Uh, in fact, we'd only had, I think, 12 inpatients during the first wave. Uh, during the current Delta wave, we've got much more involved in terms of testing. We now do uh, testing in southwestern Sydney through the SIDPATH service at St Vincent's. We've done 85,000 tests and 2,000 positive cases through that testing. We've had more than 100 inpatients, around 30 currently, and uh, but still only the one death. Um, so I just wanted to very briefly um, talk about the natural history. And I think it's a very difficult sort of therapeutic area, COVID-19, partly because it has a very short viremic period. I mean, Annie and I have been working on hepatitis C, a very different virus causes a chronic infection uh, that we can you know, eradicate. Um, the reality with COVID-19 is uh, we eliminate this virus ourselves uh, when we're infected as a uh, viremic sort of period generally of only several days. Um, so therefore, to intervene with an antiviral agent or another agent that's going to affect that sort of viral kinetics, um, you have to diagnose people early and get an effective antiviral sort of going very quickly. But then the, the viremic period then can lead on to triggering a sort of cytokine type you know, inflammatory uh, response. And that can be the thing that really drives disease progression. Um, you've probably heard the term cytokine storm. People can have rapid progression to severe pulmonary disease and a very significant inflammatory response. 
Um, but that does bring into the sort of sphere immunomodulator reagents, and I'll talk a little bit about those as we go forward. Um, the key factor in terms of risk of severe disease, hospitalisation, and death from COVID-19 is age, and it is an exponential increase in, in risk of fatality. Um, if you look at the figure on the left, you can see at the age above so about 80, the case, the, sorry, the infection fatality rate is around about 10%. But if you're the age less than 40, then your risk of dying is less than one in a thousand. So a huge sort of difference uh, by age. Um, so very, very key um, factor. I just wanted to, as I said, cover a little bit of information around a couple of the key therapeutic interventions that we've been using. So remdesivir is an antiviral that had been previously developed for other uh, viral infections. Um, is given uh, for a five-day period, so intravenously. And in the randomised controlled trial against placebo, uh, there was a significant benefit in terms of shortening time to recovery. Um, a very sort of modest benefit, though, in terms of mortality at day 29, so 11.4% versus 15.2%. And when they looked at the particular groups, these are people who have been hospitalised um, that remdesivir has been used for. It's really the group of patients that were receiving oxygen but uh, hadn't progressed to requiring non-invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO. So those sort of groups that had more advanced disease really didn't benefit from remdesivir. So this has been used predominantly for people who are hospitalised that require a supplemental oxygen but are not sort of further progressed. Then we look at dexamethasone. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Incredibly cheap, common you know, steroid therapy uh, that was trialled in a great sort of UK uh, large study called Recovery, where they're looking at a range of different therapeutic interventions. So given it's six milligrams a day, either oral or IV, for up to 10 days. Um, and the primary endpoint of the trial was mortality at 28 days um, and really showed a significant sort of benefit in terms of reduction in mortality. Um, so to reduce mortality by to around about 20%. When they looked at the groups that benefited, um, the groups that were on supplemental oxygen had significant reduction in mortality, uh, but also the more advanced groups, so uh, patients that were uh, requiring invasive mechanical ventilation really had quite significant reduction. You can see uh, with a rate ratio of 0.64, so a 36% reduction in mortality in those patients. So they're the sort of patients that we really use dexamethasone for. Um, so it is a very valuable, as I said, incredibly cheap, easy to use agent. If you look at the NIH therapeutic guidelines, Australia has its own sort of clinical task force that, that is looking at various agents as they came through, but I thought it was just useful to look at the NIH sort of guidance. So this is the guidance for patients in the community. So patients that have early disease or generally mild disease, not requiring hospitalisation or supplemental oxygen. So this is where citrovimab comes in. It's one of the monoclonal antibody therapeutics that's been developed. There's a couple of others uh, that have been evaluated that are found to be effective as well. And I'll talk a little bit more shortly about citrovimab. In terms of those patients uh, that have more severe disease that are hospitalised, I've mentioned remdesivir and dexamethasone. Um, the other agent that we use is an interleukin-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, um, and we use that again for patients that are uh, hospitalised, that require supplemental oxygen. We tend to keep it for those that have evidence of quite significant systematic inflammation. Um, so a CRP of generally greater than 75 is one of the sort of indicators in terms of use of tocilizumab. One of the problems is that there's an international shortage of tocilizumab, so we have been using some baricitinib, uh, a different uh, immunomodulatory agent. Okay, so just to citrovimab, because it is an agent that uh, we will be using uh, going forward. As I said, the TGA approved it only a week or so ago, gave it provisional approval. And the TGA approval states that you can use it in adults or adolescents aged 12 years or above uh, in patients with COVID-19 who do not require initiation of oxygen and are at increased risk of progression 
to hospitalization or deaths. Um, the clinical sort of committee that looked at this um, agreed that the key thing in terms of uh, deciding who should have citrovimab was the existence of comorbidities rather than just age, although age is an important factor. So comorbidities included diabetes, requiring medication, obesity, chronic kidney disease, congestive heart failure, COPD and asthma requiring medication. And the Australian government's pre-purchased uh, 7,700 doses of citrovimab for the national medical stockpile and I think is just about to start their first distribution um, later this week, in fact. Um, and as I said, there's a national COVID-19 clinical evidence task force that reviews all the new therapies, the trials that sort of being conducted and uh, makes recommendations uh, in terms of use within the Australian context. So they've stated that consider using citrovimab for the treatment of COVID-19 within five days of symptom onset in adults who do not require oxygen and have one or more risk factors for disease progression. So if we look at the clinical trial evidence uh, shortly, uh, just to finally say that it's given as an IV infusion over 30 minutes with a sort of 60 minute subsequent post-infusion observation period for, has been rare uh, occurrences of anaphylaxis and there are some uh, reactions that can occur. So this is uh, the major trial that looked at citrovimab in patients uh, who are not hospitalized and it led to an 85% reduction in hospitalization uh, compared to placebo. Not a huge trial, but a really quite significant uh, result. So 7% of patients uh, progressed to hospitalization in the placebo arm versus only 1% in the citrovimab arm. So it's important to look at the inclusion criteria for the trial. So people have to be within five days of symptom onset, have an oxygen saturation and room air of 94 or above, and be either above or 55 years or above, or younger age individuals down to 18 with underlying conditions and the conditions that I've sort of previously mentioned. But some Specifics around those conditions, they had to have a BMI greater than 30, an EGFR less than 60 as a comorbidity, and chronic heart failure in terms of New York Heart Association class two or above. So some specific criteria that could be utilized in terms of deciding whether patients sort of fit that criteria for having comorbidities. Um, this is the adverse effects, and you'll see that in the citrovimab, um, um, in the study, in fact, it was reduced as you'd expect, COVID-19 pneumonia, pneumonia, you know, reduced headaches and dehydration. Uh, the only thing that where there was a trend towards increased incidence was uh, diarrhea with a slight, the higher rate of diarrhea in the citrovimab arm versus the placebo arm. Um, so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about long COVID. As I mentioned, we're following a large number of patients post-COVID that have been diagnosed through the St. Vincent's Clinic, and most of them having relatively mild acute COVID-19. So as I said, you get this sort of viremic sort of period initially um, that can sort of trigger in many people uh, an ongoing debilitating illness. So even those patients who have what we would describe as relatively mild or moderate acute COVID-19 appear to have, you know, significant ongoing sort of symptoms. So some of the common symptoms are fatigue, uh, they can have sort of joint pains, myalgias in fact, they can have ongoing dyspnea and exertional dyspnea and uh, persistent cough sometimes, uh, more though dyspnea. Um, clearly there's some sleep disturbance and we certainly see cognitive uh, impairment type issues, issues around attention and concentration. And there are mental health effects um, of COVID-19, absolutely. And, and I suppose one of the issues is whether that's a sort of, a, in a sense, a direct effect or an indirect effect. Um, there's chest uh, symptoms. Some patients have this sort of chest heaviness feeling that they have, they can have palpitations. Uh, we know that COVID-19 can cause myocarditis. Um, there's also the possibility of thromboembolic phenomenon and chronic kidney disease. So a number of issues that can go on for longer than a few months. Some people define long COVID as having persistence of symptoms beyond four weeks, and some people define it as having persistence of symptoms beyond 12 weeks. Um, lots of therapeutics have been looked at in terms of uh, long COVID. Some of them 
uh, anti-inflammatory agents. Um, so in terms of the hypotheses of what's happening and what's causing long COVID, there's a couple of uh, different hypotheses. One is that the virus triggers a sort of aberrant ongoing immune response and you get, in a sense, something like an autoimmune type disorder that's ongoing and might be um, you know, anti-inflammatory agents that would be effective. There's another theory that in fact, there are sort of remnants of the virus, so not you know, ongoing infectiousness based uh, virus levels, but remnants of the virus that can sort of trigger this ongoing inflammatory response. And there's uh, studies looking at sort of gut epithelial biopsies to look for the virus that will be involved in shortly as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the agents that has been looked at is Ivabradine for uh, one of the complications or one of the uh, components of long COVID, and that's postural tachycardia syndrome. And I've got one patient who has really clear sort of postural tachycardia syndrome. Uh, her heart rate really increases very sort of um, rapidly uh, on sort of mild to moderate sort of exercise. So she's about to be commenced by a cardiologist on Ivabradine. Um, so just to show you a bit of data from the ADAPT study, um, so we aim to look at the natural history of and factors associated with post-COVID symptoms, explore potential immunological mechanisms for ongoing illness, characterise post-COVID mental health impacts, uh, do some qualitative evaluation of symptoms and experience. Um, and that's been a really nice part of the study. But this was uh, our data at sort of two to three months following acute uh, infection. Um, and you can see those patients with severe acute were more likely to have persistent symptoms at two to three months. Um, we did get some patients that were sort of referred in uh, from elsewhere. So there might be a little bit of selection bias in terms of that, that group of patients. That's why I'm presenting the data on the St. Vincent's only patients. So these were patients uh, through our sort of diagnostic clinics uh, and also the total numbers. So you can see that there was an association with severe acute uh, COVID-19, but still a significant proportion of people around 30%. Um, at two to three months had persistent symptoms. If we look at those sort of symptoms, if we look at the cohort that had mild acute infection and compare their acute symptoms to the post-COVID symptoms at sort of two to three months, you can see fatigue, cough, and some with persistent anosmia. If you look at the moderate cohort, a little bit more common um, at two to three months, and the key ones being fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, um, and also some chest pain, some chest heaviness that I've described. We also followed uh, patients through to beyond 12 months or up to now, but this is sort of data that was published uh, looking at four months and then eight months after infection. And still with this sort of persistence of fatigue. So that's the main sort of you know, ongoing symptom in, in many patients, but some still with dyspnea and, and other symptoms uh, that are very troubling for patients. I initially thought that the vast majority of patients would recover within the first sort of several months post-infection, but certainly have patients I'm looking after clinically uh, now that are well beyond 12 months with significant ongoing symptoms. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of change between month four and month eight in terms of the, the proportion that do have uh, some persistence of symptoms. I said before we were interested in sort of neurocognitive functions, so we do a battery of sort of neurocognitive tests uh, to look at for deficits in terms of attention and concentration. And around about 10% have significant cognitive impairment. Again, these were initial evaluations done at sort of two to three months post-infection. We also do objective tests for smell. So there's a battery of smell tests that we uh, do for all the patients. Um, and it's interesting, those with severe acute uh, infection uh, have, are more likely to have deficits in terms of uh, smell. And then when we correlated the cognitive impairment with the smell test deficits, in fact, neurocognitive impairment was seen in 22% of patients if they had olfaction impairment versus only 4% if they had no olfaction impairment. And there's a theory that the, you know, the virus itself may travel along the olfactory nerves um, and that therefore sort of showing the, you know, the genesis in a sense of the anosmia, but also potentially the pathway uh, to infection or involvement of the brain. 
to a really interesting ongoing area for research. I'm not going to go through this in detail. There's some good resources. This is one uh, published in the BMJ. Just making a couple of points in terms of care for people with uh, long COVID. I think it's really important in terms of listening and empathy. Uh, a little bit like chronic fatigue syndrome, and I think uh, also ME, that many of these patients were dismissed uh, by many doctors as it being psychological. Uh, that's absolutely not the case. I said we're doing some immunological studies. It's really interesting to look at the immunological cytokine profiles in these patients to several months post-infection, and then there's clearly an immunological signal uh, in, in patients post-COVID. Also, in terms of self-pacing and gradual increase in exercise, if tolerated. And certainly something that we don't encourage people to try and exercise their way through. I think rest uh, is really, really important in people with post-COVID sort of symptoms. And they really, many of them have to be brought along quite gently. Um, just wanted to move on to uh, uh, looking at strains and looking at vaccine effectiveness. And as I said, uh, in the Q&A session, that Delta has absolutely become the dominant strain uh, globally. Initially, we had what we described as a Wuhan strain, and then the Alpha strain, initially sort of uh, isolated in the UK, became you know what one of the key sort of uh, strains circulating globally. But then Delta has really taken over because of its increased infectiousness. Um, so a few key points about Delta, which has certainly been a game changer. It's been described as a variant of concern. As I said, the dominant variant globally. What we call the R R naught, which is the value of infectiousness, is between five to eight. That means that without any restrictions, any social distancing, uh, an infected person would on average infect five to eight people versus two to three for the original strain and three to four for the alpha strain. As a high viral load, in fact, the nasopharyngeal swabs, a three log increase compared to the original strain, really quite marked increase. A slightly shorter incubation period, the normal incubation period is about five days, but with Delta it seems to be about four days from exposure to symptom onset. I don't think there's much evidence in terms of causing more severe disease. A little bit lower vaccine effectiveness, but not as uh, impacted upon as the beta strain, which was the strain that originally was isolated in South Africa. Um, but it does make herd immunity not feasible, certainly in the short to medium term. The high level of infectiousness really makes it pretty much impossible, even at extremely high vaccination coverage. And this sort of shows you why. So if you've got vaccine efficacy in terms of protection of infection between, say, 60 percent and 80 percent, it might have been feasible with the Wuhan strain to reach uh, herd immunity if you had coverage to the vaccine between 70 and sort of 90 percent. But then you move into the Delta variant sort of and you can see that even at 100 percent of vaccine coverage you wouldn't reach herd immunity uh, because of the uh, infectiousness of the variant and, and the fact that these vaccines don't provide sterilizing immunity. So they're not providing um, 100 percent protection against infection. Okay, just on to the effectiveness of the two key vaccines that we're using. So the BNT vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the CHADOX1 vaccine is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And I wanted to focus on data around Delta. You can see even after one dose, you do get a significant uh, impact in terms of reduced uh, infection sort of risk of around about 50%. And then if we move to a more than 14 days after the second dose, the protection against Delta infection is about two thirds with the AstraZeneca vaccine and about 80% um, with the Pfizer vaccine. So you know, not too bad when you think about it. When we started out to develop COVID-19 vaccines, I think we would have been absolutely overjoyed if we thought that these vaccines prevented most severe disease, but also prevented infection. It's important to note that in previous studies, so this study, that uh, the impact of vaccine on severe disease sort of risk is, is one dose of AstraZeneca, about a 70% reduction. Pfizer was a single dose, gets to 90%. But the AstraZeneca vaccine seems to catch up after the second dose. So after two doses, more than a 90% reduction in Delta variant hospitalization. So really incredibly impressive with these vaccines. This is a bit more data in terms of efficacy against symptomatic infection, efficacy against all infection and efficacy against hospitalization. 
various studies around the world, but just to make the point that these vaccines are still highly effective against the Delta variant. And this is going back to the UK study, it's quite interesting, where they looked at whether there might be a change in protection against infection over time. So you can see the BNT is the Pfizer vaccine, starting out soon after the second dose, then it's at a risk in terms of odds of infection of about 0.1, so 90% reduction in infection risk. The AstraZeneca was sitting at about 70%. After about sort of three months post the second dose, it looks like there is a bit of waning of protection against infection and that the Pfizer the protection is about to sort of to be pretty similar to the AstraZeneca uh, protection at around about 60%, maybe by month four post the second dose. So there may be some waning of protection, but that's a waning of protection against infection. There are other explanations for why that might be waning because of multiple exposures, um, you know, rather than it really losing sort of um, immunological protection. It's important to note that there's not significant evidence of waning of protection against severe disease, at least over the first sort of six to eight months. This is interesting, it's looking within these two vaccines at the dosing interval. So in the UK, they've used various sort of dosing intervals. When they looked at dosing interval either less than nine weeks or greater than or equal to nine weeks, so the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine, no difference. So in fact, even though the recommended interval for AstraZeneca was 12 weeks, there's really no reason why you shouldn't shorten that interval, particularly if you're in the context of an outbreak. So my recommendation for people in Sydney would be to have their second dose of AstraZeneca at four to six weeks. There's also no issue if you want to lengthen the interval for Pfizer if you've got short supply. So in Sydney, we've been trying to get as many people to have at least one dose. Um, so we, we extended the interval, which is normally three to four weeks to you know, six to nine weeks. So you can sort of move those intervals around as you need. There's plenty of AstraZeneca, so we can have a short interval. If we're in short supply of Pfizer, we can lengthen that interval. Um, this is data, it's a, a little bit sort of you know, complex, but I just wanted to make the point that some people were concerned about breakthrough infections um, having a similar sort of viral load. So some people who are back, fully vaccinated do become infected with the Delta variant. There's no doubt about that. And it looks as though their level of virus is similar to unvaccinated uh, individuals. This is a healthcare worker study. But when they did studies looking at whether the virus could be cultured, so to look at sort of infectivity of the virus, they found that the infectivity of the virus was lower in people that had vaccine breakthrough infections versus the unvaccinated. So even though the level of the virus may be the same, there may be some reduced infections in those who have breakthrough infections. We can already see the remarkable impact of vaccines in the New South Wales for the Delta wave. This is data up until early sort of August, and you can see only about 1% of all cases up to then were amongst people that were fully vaccinated. Um, if you look at cases uh, in terms of hospitalisation and intensive care, um, you'll see that no one up until the early August in ICU had been fully vaccinated. I think there's been one patient subsequently and currently I think 130 patients roughly in ICU and only one of them fully vaccinated. So really it's an amazing real world evidence of the impact of vaccination. This is data from, from Victoria, in fact their current sort of Delta outbreak. And it really shows you that this is the proportion of people with first dose and second dose um, of vaccine by age group. But you can see the increasing proportion as you move into the older age groups. Um, this is the proportion of the population at each age group. And this in the blue is the proportion of cases. So you can see this sort of shift to a younger sort of age epidemic. Um, partly because of the impact of vaccination that's really shifting the sort of burden in a sense of the outbreak to those younger individuals. I just sort of finally I just wanted to contrast the situation in, in many countries around the world. So I did this a few days ago but at that stage we were at 43% uh, first dose, 24% uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, you compare that to many of the total population, not of the eligible population. So if you think of the 80% target we're heading for, that in fact is only 64% of the total population. 
Uh, and then you look at other countries, UK, people have, have said have done incredibly well, but they are only at 63%. That's about where the 80% mark would be, as I said, 64% of the total population. But there are countries that have done even better. So Denmark, um, Singapore and Iceland, 70% uh, or high of the total population. I think Singapore is getting very close to 80%. This is where I'd really like us to head. If we could get to levels of 70% of the total population, that would be about 85% of the adult uh, eligible population at the moment. And they're seeing very small numbers of deaths. So Denmark, a country of around 6 million people, they're seeing a thousand cases a day, uh, but only one death a day on average. So I think that would be you know, where we could head. Singapore has been quite remarkable as well in terms of their rollout. Um, this shows you the enormous sort of global inequity around vaccination. So you can see these large sort of you know, delta resurgent sort of um, outbreaks in Portugal, Spain and UK. And this is cases uh, per 100,000 and deaths per 2 million, so different scale, but relatively smaller burden of deaths compared to these countries here that have very low levels of vaccine coverage. So only 2% of low income countries uh, globally, 2% um, of individuals in low income countries are fully vaccinated. So we've got an enormous amount to do in terms of global vaccine equity. Um, what does the future look like? Um, well, I have a 16 year old son who was just getting into you know, hanging out at gigs down the mosh pit, had his first sort of crowd surfing experience in late 2019. I'd really be keen for him to get back to that experience. I think we can, I think we can get to the other side. Um, you know, hopefully early next year, things will be very, very different. So uh, just finally, um, thanks to many people in terms of those involved uh, in the ADAPT study, particularly Gail Matthews, an ID physician, it's Vincent and David Daly, a respiratory physician uh, that head up the ADAPT study. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Greg, for that um, comprehensive tour. Um, there's been some questions. Um, I might just do the first couple um, that are more about um, Trovimab. Um, one that was asked, um, will the availability increase? You know, will we be likely to get more, do you think? Um, yeah, we should. Um, it's a pretty expensive therapy. Um, I don't know exactly how much the government sort of paid for it. They, they, they tend to keep those things uh, fairly quiet. Um, but I imagine it's in the thousands of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. Um, so the initial purchase is 7,700. I think each LHD that has significant cases is now getting an allocation. Um, I think uh, Western New South Wales has 20, I think, is that right, uh, Annie, um, yeah. for next week. And 20, 20 a week, is it? Is that the plan for the next few yeah. weeks, I think? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, there has to be some rationing um, because you've got obviously over 100 cases that you're managing in the community. Um, then St Vincent's has a smaller community case load. We've got, I think, 10 allocations uh, next week. Um, so my sort of advice would be obviously to use it for people with really significant comorbidities. Um, so if you've got a patient who's obese with diabetes, you know, maybe it may have been a smoker, um, you've got a collection of comorbidities there. So that patient, even if they were say in their forties, to me is more concerning than someone who was 60 that you know, didn't have much in the way of comorbidities. Um, so I, you know, the unfortunate thing about the study is it wasn't big enough to really develop a sort of tool that could say, well, these comorbidities are the ones that really uh, you should score more highly. Um, but you know, some common sense has to be used. I mean, we're going to develop a sort of uh, a bit of an algorithm and criteria for, for assessing people. I'm happy to sort of share that um, as we develop it. Yeah, that would be good because we we're talking about it again today. And I guess someone had just said, will it be available to um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people out west? Um, I guess I can sort of answer that um, in that, yeah, that is um, very much so. And it is going to be very, I mean, there's going to be a level of um, three people, um, an infectious disease, respiratory, and also a sort of ethicist as well. Um, and I guess the aim, who will be the people who will um, be overseeing because it, um, but yes, yeah, certainly, um, yeah, priority will definitely be given to um, people who are much more regional and remote, who necessarily aren't next to an ICU, um, yeah. and who are definitely 
Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, which are the most affected community in, in our region. You know, everyone's going to try and be as you know, um, as fair about the whole process. Um, they will just in the next week. The thing is, I suppose we didn't say it is going to be an infusion. So it will be 30 minute infusion and then watched for yeah. an hour but after. It's, so. it's, a, it's pretty straightforward. Like it's eight mils diluted in I think 50 to 100 mils of saline and run over 30 minutes. And so I think it's pretty straightforward in terms of administration, the sort of toxicity to those sort of, you know, rare severe sort of reactions are, are very very rare um, but that's why you keep people for a 60 minute observation sort of period. I think some patients can get sort of urticarial type sort of reaction and, and other sort of allergic type sort of responses sometimes you apparently have to slow the infusion down but um, I think pretty I mean mostly it's very very well tolerated um, but it does mean you, know, you need a you need somewhere to take positive cases and we all know the sort of you know, the complexity sometimes of moving and you know, managing positive you know, patients with the requirement for PPE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm involved now in care at Parkley Prison. Um, so we're trying to sort of work out where, how we're going to do all that um, in terms of the patients in Parkley. Um, we're sort of sorting that out at St Vincent's as well in terms of bringing people in, from the community into a specific area in the hospital where we can give them the infusion. No, thanks. There's a few, um, I'll just start going through this um, next lot or a bit more immunisation. Um, will booster shots be mandatory? So I don't think they'll be mandatory. I think what, look, ATAGI is looking at a range of issues and boosters is one of them. Um, it was interesting, I was asked to be a spokesperson for advocating for boosters. I was a, a little bit uncomfortable with that um, in the sense that you know, I think there may be some evidence of waning of protection against infection. Um, however, I can't see much evidence for waning of protection against severe disease, and that's what we really want to do. We want to stop people getting really sick and uh, um, ending up in hospital and dying from COVID-19. But in areas where it's really important to prevent infection, then there may be a role of targeting healthcare workers, uh, you know, residential aged care workers, um, so in those sort of settings where the consequence of passing on an infection would be much greater than when you've got vulnerable patients, some of whom may not be vaccinated themselves or may not have responded well to vaccination, I think that makes sense to try and provide the highest sort of level of protection for those people in those settings. But to try and pursue you know, boosters every you know, six months to reach some sort of herd immunity nirvana, forget about it. You know, it's not going to happen. Um, so I, I find it a bit distasteful um, to be using tens of millions of doses of boosters when you've got 2% of people in low income countries who have you know, full vaccination. I just, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, I can see that there may be a role if there's some more evidence emerges that particularly for older patients, that there is some waning in terms of protection of, of severe disease, then there may be a role for targeting elderly patients, people with immune compromise who may not have responded as well to the sort of two dose initial vaccination schedule. Um, so look, you know, the federal government's purchased 85 million doses, <laughs> I mean, to sort of boost everyone. So um, it's gonna be there, I don't know. What, so I presume they're gonna sort of offer it, but I think what should happen is that we get as many people as possible vaccinated first time round and try and get to as high coverage as we can. And I think we've got to go beyond 80% eligible. We've got to vaccinate kids. Um, I'm, I'm not a supporter of vaccinating kids because I think they have a high risk of severe disease. They don't, they have a very low risk of severe disease. I think the risk of long COVID in kids has been overplayed. I think it's actually a very low risk, particularly in the younger age kids of long COVID. And there's a couple of good studies that have looked at controlled sort of populations as well. And really there's not much in it in terms of long COVID. So why would you vaccinate sort of kids? One, because this, the vaccines look very safe, certainly in the 12 to 15 year old age group, I think they'll probably be very safe in the younger age kids as well. But I think what it does do is it gives you as a family sort of sense of protection you know, you've got kids, everyone's sort of got the vaccine, everyone's sort of protected. I think it'll be potentially important for travel. I think it's important to keep schools open. 
So you know, to vaccinate teachers, vaccinate kids, I think is really sort of crucial to once we get through this period in New South Wales to make sure that, that schools stay open. So I hope that all secondary age kids get vaccinated before the end of this year. And hopefully if the trials for the under 12s, and they should be reporting in the next month or so, if they come through favourably on safety and efficacy and the sort of timeline matches with TGA approval, that we could even vaccinate primary school age kids before they go back to school next year. So that would be the ideal scenario, I think. And then uh, parents would be less anxious. There's a lot of sort of panic around at the moment, even though the vast majority of kids are absolutely fine. Um, and then after we've done all that, then maybe sort of boosters before winter next year. And you might imagine then lining people up for the flu shot and giving them a booster of sort of a COVID-19 vac vaccine. There's been some hesitancy around giving those two vaccines together, but I'm sure there'll be studies by then that'll show there's no problem at all giving those vaccines at the same time. Um, so I think that's the sort of strategy I think Atagi are looking at, looking at at the moment. And it'll be with mRNA or Novavax. I mean, AstraZeneca will slowly sort of slip away uh, as a vaccine. Unfortunately, I think it's a great vaccine. I think it gives you, you know, potentially longer lasting protection than, than the Pfizer vaccine. I think the risk of severe clots is so low. Um, I've used the sort of anecdote, not really an anecdote, but the saying on social media that if I woke up this morning and had a one in a million risk of dying, and I did that every morning, I would live for well over a thousand years. Um, in fact, the calculation I think is 1,770 something years. Um, but it just gives you an idea of how we sort of look at a risk and think it's a significant risk when it's a very, very insignificant sort of risk in terms of levels of risk uh, and other things we do in our life that are much, much riskier than a one in a million chance of fatality. Um, but look, you know, people get concerned about that, um, obviously. I've been a proponent of vaccination from day one. I've been very pro AstraZeneca the whole way through, despite getting abused on social media because of that um, earlier in the year. Um, but I think things have certainly changed. Um, Mm. Oh, thanks. We've answered a few of the questions that were around um, children there. I guess the next one is what transition steps do you see in actual loosening of restrictions? Yeah, look, I, look, I think there's a lot of anxiety around. I can absolutely understand that. I think I think some of the messaging's not great. So, you know, should never be calling things freedom days, should never be fixating on one level of sort of vaccine sort of coverage. Um, the reality is that the higher coverage we get, the better. You know, so the New South Wales is going gangbusters in terms of coverage. If we continue this sort of rate, um, to the supply is increasing, it'll meet demand soon, but we need to keep sort of vaccinating. I, you know, I hope we can get to not just 80% of the 16 and up population, but 80% of the total population, which is where Singapore's you know, uh, ended up. And there, you know, they've got a phased approach of you know, easing restrictions in Singapore, seeing a very small number of cases and then a very few deaths. Um, so that, that would be absolutely the ideal because if you, if you get to a situation where New South Wales is 80% eligible population vaccinated, but 35% of the Aboriginal population is unvaccinated, that's going to be a disaster you know, if, you know, if you remove all the restrictions. So I don't think that will happen. I think there will be a very sort of phased approach, but we need to get away from this sort of notion that we'll get to these sort of 70%, then 80%, and then sort of throw open you know, the door, so to speak, to, to you know, normal life. I think we will eventually head to normal life, to pre-COVID sort of type life. It'll take a bit longer than that, and it will require us to get to you know, even higher sort of vaccine coverage to vaccinate kids that are I've mentioned. Um, but that's all feasible. Australia's a, a high vaccination you know, country. We don't have you know, very high levels of hesitancy. Uh, we've got some hesitancy. Um, you know, and there's a lot of discussion about whether you should you know, even consider mandatory sort of vaccination for certain groups. I've been strongly in favour of mandatory vaccination for healthcare workers. I can't believe it's taken this long in New South Wales to get to that stage. I have to have a tetanus vaccine, the whooping cough vaccine. Um, it seems bizarre that I don't have to have a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so finally that's happened. It should have happened you know, back in March. It's a real pity that it didn't. 
I guess, next question, are there figures that we can quote to patients for how much trade-off in protection there is for the AZ dosed at 12, 8, 6 and 4 week intervals? Yeah, well, I think I think that data that sort of looked at the you know, before and well, shorter than nine weeks and longer than nine weeks um, really convinced me. I mean, the, the original data from the trials, there was no, there's been no randomised trial, that's the first thing to say, that's compared four weeks to eight weeks or 12 weeks. No randomised trials. All the, all the analyses were post hoc analyses and there were reasons why some people had longer sort of intervals and you know, versus shorter sort of intervals temporal reasons and various other things so it's a bit of a messy analysis anyway um but that sort of data that i showed i thought was quite reassuring um so there's this theoretical thing about sort of a longer interval how that may be sort of beneficial etc cetera, etc cetera. but i would absolutely use the current situation to determine when I had my second shot. So if you were in Perth, for example, then okay, you could have your you know, interval of 12 weeks. But if you're in New South Wales, absolutely get your second dose as soon as possible. That's my sort of you know, my advice. So four to you know, six weeks at the most, probably after your first dose of AstraZeneca, that's what I would be advocating. Thanks. I guess someone said, um, will our government donate some of vaccines to developing countries? <laughs> Well, they've done a little bit. I mean, they gave some doses to Papua New Guinea. Um, they've sort of, you know, they were part of this four nation sort of you know, agreement between the United States, Japan, uh, India and Australia, which was basically a pushback against you know, China and their sort of bilateral sort of you know, arrangements with many countries around the world. Um, so to be honest, I think Australia's dropped the ball um, in terms of, um, you know, anything but national interests. I mean, we're not the only country that's done that, um, but I would have hoped that they would have donated uh, much more to COVAX in terms of you know, monetary sort of donation, uh, being pretty paltry. Um, and look, the, the terrible thing is that you know, a company like Pfizer um, has donated a tiny, tiny fraction of their sort of output to the COVAX facility, which is providing sort of global sort of access for these vaccines. It's pretty disgusting, actually, um, the behaviour. Um, but there's this sort of nationalism and national exceptionalism that uh, countries are doing what's best for themselves. But if you think about what you're trying to do, ultimately, is to control the pandemic globally. That's got to be good for you know, everyone. If you reduce the risk of you know, new variants emerging that might be more infectious, and even if you looked at it in selfish in a selfish way, you would want to sort of you know, put more effort into sort of global vaccine you know, access. Is, it, is there another question now? What do you think could be done to support smaller towns of around 2,000 people around Dubbo that now have cases within them? Yeah, look, I, I know New South Wales Health are doing a lot. I mean, I think they, they should be, you know, um, there should be some positive vibes about you know, some of the things they're doing because it's pretty tough. And look, the, the, the ball was dropped uh, in terms of vaccination, but that wasn't just the government's fault. It was certain individuals in the medical profession that were completely trashing AstraZeneca um, that pushed, you know, put us back. There was, a, there was complacency because we're all living in this sort of zero, zero COVID sort of you know, world for week after week. And we were complacent. All of us were. To a, to a degree, there wasn't a sense of sort of urgency. Um, so we sort of lost you know, several months in a way, I think because of um, those two issues. Um, you think about small towns, well, you think logistically it might be difficult because it's West New South Wales, it's tougher, but the population size makes it more feasible to send teams in to sort of rapidly you know, vaccinate people. And I would hope that that would be the sort of strategy. Um, look, I understand difficulty in some areas in terms of isolating, quarantining people. It's always a problem. It's not, a, not just a problem in Western New South Wales. It's not just a problem in Aboriginal communities. It's a problem often in, in communities where there's large families. Um, and we're seeing a lot in Southwest and Western Sydney, this issue of one person getting infected, everyone getting infected. And that appears to be something that's particularly a problem with the Delta variant, has a very high attack rate. Um, and if you're not diagnosing those cases very early, by the time you get to the other family members, they're all, they're all infected. Um, it's, and that's a phenomenon that's sort of happening 
um, absolutely in southwestern and western Sydney amongst the larger families. Um, so I'm sure we're seeing that in western uh, New South Wales and uh, in different sort of communities. Uh, but I would be hopeful that you know, the vaccination sort of you know, push would be really, really strong and that people would come forward for testing. I mean, they're the two key things, people fronting up for testing, you know, appropriately isolating and quarantining you know, uh, people contacts and then getting people to, to roll their sleeves up for vaccination. Mm. Um, someone's just popped in a question, what are the chances of Commonwealth um, making vaccination mandatory for GP practices? Um, for Okay, for people in the private system, um, like, People like yourself, Annie, and others that work in the private system. Well, well, no, I'm purely really public now, but there's many here. <laughs> Mudgy, it's come from Mudgy, this question. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a really good question, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it, but when you think about it, why should it be any different for a healthcare worker working in the public system than a healthcare worker who might come under sort of federal jurisdiction rather than um, to state jurisdiction? Um, so it is a little bit tricky because you're not officially an employee. So you know, New South Wales Health can say we'll mandate vaccination for all our employees in the New South Wales sort of public health system. Um, so I'm not sure whether that mandatory um, announcement covers people in the private system. I have to seek some advice on that. Um, but I would be absolutely in favour of all healthcare workers, whether they work in public or private system, to be mandated to have a vaccine, except for people that have medical reasons why they might want to seek an exemption. And that's, you know, that's going to be possible you know, um, in many settings where you know, businesses and other people are talking about um, mandating you know, vaccinations. And I know they were talking about it in the private hospital and um, they'd sought legal advice, um, one of the um, specialists, and they said that um, probably couldn't mandate it in the private hospital at this stage, but you could make the person wear PPE for the rest of their, their life. And so they'd probably leave get, soon after a, a week or two. You get a swab shoved up their nose every morning before work um, and a, bit, a bigger one every day. <laughs> No, no, I shouldn't be facetious. I mean, I'm sure there's some people that truly are very, very hesitant. Um, but I think, I think there's, look, I think as a healthcare worker, there's a responsibility uh, to protect your patients. And uh, part of that responsibility should be to vaccination against COVID-19. It seems like a logical, lo a logical component of protecting your patients, don't to me. On that mark, someone's just said, what would be the medical reasons for vaccine exemption? Okay, so I mean, there are some contraindications for AstraZeneca um, in terms of, but they're very, very rare. So you know, you know, a history of heparin induced thrombocytopenia syndrome, um, you know, history of you know, previous sort of TTS type sort of you know, event. Um, so they're very, very rare. Um, on the Pfizer side, if you've had an anaph you know, both of them, if you've had an anaphylactic reaction to a component of, you know, in the vaccine, you know, that's a contraindication. But we're, we're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny sort of proportions of people that would have a medical reason for an exemption. Um, but there's hesitancy. I remember when I was on call a few weeks ago, I'd have to be approving all these rapid swabs because you know, the cardiologist wanted to you know, do a stent. I was saying, well, we need to know whether our patients have got COVID-19. I said, well, everyone's vaccinated. And said, no, a third of the nurses in the cath lab were not vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Um, and this was you know, in early August. Um, I mean, I just found that remarkable um, that there was this level of sort of you know, hesitancy. Look, some of them were waiting for Pfizer, presumably. Um, but anyway. Just on that, is low platelet secondary to chemotherapy a contraindication? No, no, it's not. Uh, so thrombocytopenia is not a contraindication for AstraZeneca. Yeah. I mean... Um, nor, nor, so is clot, nor is clot hist like general clot history is not a, a contraindication. There's no association with you know, prior sort of you know, clots. And hmm. and someone's just got hopefully future COVID tests can be point of care um, with results available instantly. 
Look, I, I've been a huge advocate of rapid antigen testing. Um, I think we should be utilising it a lot more. We should be utilising it for essential workers in southwestern and western Sydney. That should be daily. I mean, there's a little bit of an issue with reduced sensitivity um, and there's the occasional false positive. But it doesn't matter about the occasional false positive. You've got a confirmatory test anyway. Um, so a bit lower sensitivity, not, not as big an issue with the Delta variant because it's got a higher level of the virus. Um, and the cases that you, you would be missing would be low viral level cases anyway, are less sort of infectious. So in terms of control of the spread of the virus, uh, I've been saying this for weeks now, that we should be doing rapid antigen testing in all essential workers uh, on dunno, potentially a daily basis. Um, so dunno, it can be utilised, I think, also in the healthcare setting. So for example, at the moment, if you're a close contact, even if you're fully vaccinated, you've got to you know, isolate for 14 days. That's ridiculous. In terms of trying to get people back into the system, we've got 1,200 healthcare workers who are isolating at the moment in Sydney for 14 days. I would have a maximum of seven days you know, isolation if they were fully vaccinated. They could have you know, testing at sort of two and five days, and maybe they could even use rapid antigen testing for the second week. You know, if you wanted to sort of continue uh, that sort of monitoring, but to keep people out of the system, you know, for 14 days who are fully vaccinated, where you could sort of uh, exclude sort of the significant sort of risk of ongoing sort of transmission, um, seems crazy. I think we've just got to be more sort of sensible about uh, the type of uh, setup we have for, for isolation and quarantine. Sorry, I have quarantine for the, those cases particularly fully vaccinated people. Thank you very much. I might just segue into, there's just the last little bit that I was just wanting to talk about that sort of talks a little bit. I, someone's just commented there was, I doubt, well, Kenya has a rapid testing PCR machine. Um, but And then a comment about what can we do with the towns of less than 2,000. I guess just as a background, a lot of you will now be aware, but basically, um, over the last three weeks, there's some amazing um, people, including Mel Berry, who's one of the RNGD physicians who basically have set up similar to, you know, RPA virtual and sorry, what, you know, what Greg have in Sydney, where you've basically got a virtual hospital in the home. Um, they've now got over 560 people that they're managing in the community with COVID. Um, and so anyone now, the pathway, um, is you can now download this and have a look. But basically everyone that the PHU diagnoses with COVID then gets referred to remote monitoring. Um, the remote monitoring team now has sort of Melbury, Lisa Phipps, who's a renal physician, and Alan Kerrigan as a paediatrician as their leads. Um, they're referred to the remote monitoring team. A sat probe and a thermometer is arranged to go out to their household or to wherever they are. And then they are all risk stratified. Someone takes the, the one of the nurses originally will ring them and take um, a history, and then they'll get sort of risk stratified. Um, they have a daily, basically, um, ward round, morning and evening. Um, they also, if the nurses have um, any concerns, then the whole of the VRGS um, medical GP system. Um, has they've replicated another arm of that that's basically the COVID arm so that if anyone is high, deemed high risk they will get a, a sort of VRGS um, review. If the team below are concerned about someone that they've, that they've got a team of, of people ringing them and checking their SAP probes everything if they're concerned they'll also escalate up to the VRGS um, and then if, I mean, anyone at any stage, if they're obviously worried, it's the usual triple O escalation phase, but then anyone that the VRGS doctors are worried about, they then will talk to the team leads, Mel and Lisa and Alan Kerrigan, who will then arrange for the hospital. I guess what we're trying to do is avoid ED for a lot of those people and to try and reduce the COVID footprint really. So that's been working well that we know a lot of the positive people their admissions already been planned, um, whether they're to go straight to ICU, whether to go straight to the medical ward. The wonderful thing of it is it's a district wide, so it's for, it is for Western New South Wales. Unfortunately, it's not involving Far West at this stage. And um, 
um, yet to hear a little bit more. We were just sort of saying today we must find out more of what's happening in the far west. But I guess for your, this whole system is 24 hours now. So there's someone, nurses, doctors on 24 hour. There is the 1 um, 800 number that everyone is given, and you're all free, to, you know, if you've got queries about patients. Um, we have included, Ivy's been doing a lot of wonderful work behind the scenes trying to get um, the GPs notified. Um, hopefully, that system will start to be a lot more streamlined because they've just been swamped. Suddenly, you've gone from a hospital 11 cases to um, a ward of 150 and now up to 560. So, everyone apologises if things have been. Maybe there's been a few gaps in, well, in the system, um, but the aim will be that as soon as a patient is um, identified that the PHU will ask who is their GP or who was the last practice that they went to, because we recognise a lot of this community won't necessarily have one GP that they're always seeing, but we want to try to get at least the last practice that they've seen. And then ho hopefully that will then be, not the general practice will be notified um, so that they will know and can support the person and the family through it as well too. There will also be people who are in shared hotel accommodation or shars and um, a lot of you, if someone is in one of those shars, you will, they will all get a, um, someone from the VRGS will take a medical, a full medical history, we'll find out who is their general practice and for the time that they're, I mean, we're finding that a lot of, there is a lot of social and welfare um, issues a lot more with the Delta strain. So a lot of it's unaccompanied minors, people who just aren't safe at home, homeless, whatever. So there is, um, you know, special hotel accommodation is being set up. And for those people, um, their GPs will be uh, approached to take just all their general care for every non-related COVID care. And every town now has a pharmacy that's been set up <laughs> with a dedicated pharmacy where you can send your scripts um, for your patients in the SHAR and they will deliver um, to the um, door of wherever they are. And I'm sure those pharmacies would be happy to do it the same for any of your other COVID patients that you know. Um, so there is a whole lot of systems and Ivy's building a lot of this into to health pathways. So um, it's a bit of a work in, in progress. I guess the next thing will be sort of building in this uh, Trobimab, um, or how, how do I pronounce it, Greg? I'm, yeah, that's pretty good. Cool. It's a <laughs> anyway, that's, um, that's just, um, again, hot off the press. Um, so we're all busy scullying around trying to find, as, as Greg said, places where we can bring in people who have got COVID and get them in from the community, but not bringing them in, into the actual hospital setting. Um, and um, so the aim will, will, will be to get yeah, that happening um, and hopefully prevent a lot of people ending up um, It's true hospital in the home, as I say, if we can do this and prevent people coming into um, hospital and ending up in ICU. And so it's it's quite an exciting um, time at the moment. Yes, there is 10 doses, I believe, in Orange and there'll be 10 in Dubbo, but there is more promised um, and it, we're starting to roll out and it will go, the priority is certainly going to be the areas that are, have got the most um, population living with um, living with COVID and the aim is to get it ideally as Greg said in the the first five days but you were sort of saying as early as possible really Greg isn't it? Yeah I mean if you had someone that high sort of risk category you know absolutely early as possible. Um, I mean it's interesting they did a, a trial uh, with the same agent for inpatients and it like no benefit so you've got to, you've got to get people early uh, within five days of simple onset. Um, is that right? There is just a few more questions. Why is the reason RAT is not more available for healthcare workers? So what's not available? The oh, rapid oh, antigen testing. Um, look, there's a big fight with the pathologists um, about this. So you know, it's about who controls you know, the testing and the monetary sort of streams to that. And um, there's some look, there's some legitimate concerns around, well, you know, who's going to sort of read those tests and it's not just like a pregnancy test you get from the chemist. Although in some countries, that's what it's ended up like in Singapore, actually send people out a bunch of them. In Europe, a lot of people are just using them. They can buy them sort of pretty freely, I don't know, 20 bucks, I think, a, a test to get the result in 20 minutes. Um, so that, like, I think we've got to get through some of the regulatory issues around it and some of the sort of oversight issues in terms of laboratory reporting. 
um, and there needs to be a bit of urgency around this because I think it's a technology that we could really utilize. Great. Right. And then just um, another comment. Some of the most vulnerable patients are in Wilcannia and hopefully someone is considering Citrovimab in this lo yeah, locality. And yes, um, I would um, I certainly think that Burke, Wilcannia are gonna be the targeted areas that some of it's just organizing um, the setup. So I think, you know, that be something that's certainly on everyone's agenda, but it's just the setup, as I say, everything's, um, it's only day one <laughs> today, I think that so, yes, will be one week. But um, it, yes, um, I'd like to, I think we're sort of getting very much near the end of our time or we've gone a bit over. So I thank you very much everyone for participating. I'm particularly like to thank Patrick and uh, Greg for coming along and sharing all their wealth of knowledge. Um, and yes, I think the PHN is probably planning. If you've got other ideas for other um, sessions, please um, let Katie and the team know just on that note there, your feedback is valued and we'd love you to just take a moment to um, hover your smart device over the QR image and do the short online survey. And um, I'm sure if you've got further questions, um, you can always somehow with either Greg or Patrick, different things, you can um, flick them to myself or Katie and we can send the email off for getting um, answers and questions that, um, to anyone who has any specific questions I'm, that I might have missed. Sorry, I apologise to, I realised I was sometimes, that's why I've been writing them, I was actually putting things in the garbage before I had, luckily I'd written them down, but I apologise if there's any, I'm learning this system, if I might have omitted a question and put in the bin. Um, my gravest apologies. Um, please send the question through and I'll ensure that it gets answered. Thank you so much, Annie, for um, facilitating tonight. It's just Katie here. And also a big thanks to um, Professor Dore and Patrick Cashman. Your time is truly valued and um, I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening and um, everyone stay safe and take care of yourselves too. My pleasure, <laughs> thanks Katie. Thank you all so much. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.